this is Pranav Guha Thakurta from Edu TV, the first education channel of India, in our famous program on higher education, the famous Vice Chancellor. Today we have the famous Dr. Singh, Dr. Raj Singh, with us. Dr. Singh is the Vice Chancellor of the prestigious Jain University, Bangalore, India. He is a professional with sound experience of academic leadership, administration, systems development, team management, governance, and institution building. Dr. Raj Singh had set up many universities in India and had been associated with famous brands, best of the brands like Amity, Ansels, to name a few. He's also an Air Force veteran. So, Mr. Chancellor, welcome from EduTV. How are you, sir? Fine. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you for having me. Sir, we wanted your advice for the, all the stakeholders of education. How curiosity can be inculcated amongst students? We are asking in context to schools as well as the higher education. Over to you, Mr. Chancellor. Thank you, Pranav. Uh, thank you for having me. You know, you reminded me of uh, a statement which I read in 2020. Uh, the COVID had just set in and uh, inculcating curiosity or sparking curiosity was one of the major debate going on, particularly in online mode. Okay. And there's a gentleman called uh, Terry Hick. He okay. said, he said that if we want to save education as we know it, we need to hand over the power to learn to the learners. Right. I think for ages, uh, we as teachers, whether in school or higher education, we have somehow controlled the uh, teaching learning in our own hands. And we have denied uh, the learners from having this power. And I think uh, uh, this is where uh, the answer lies to question. I congratulate you for uh, choosing such a topical issue, in fact, which is uh, the concern for all of us as uh, right. academic administration, teachers, uh, owners, or uh, people like me as vice chancellors. Um, you know, uh, there are various ways, uh, there are various strategies you can find in books, uh, how to uh, enhance curiosity, how to uh, inculcate curiosity. But I would like to be more anecdotal and uh, share my own experiences uh, with the audience today. And I'm sure uh, I'll be able to give examples which uh, have definitely helped inculcate curiosity among the children of the school as well as higher education students. And you know, uh, if you look at the theory, the first, first thing says that a model curiosity, but the question comes how to model curiosity. Uh, we as teachers, you must have seen many of us don't like students asking questions. Right. We either don't answer it or we don't encourage them to ask the questions. In fact, one of the first and foremost uh, thing in modeling curiosity is that we should not only answer the questions, but we should encourage questions. And we must uh, encourage and then if somebody asks good questions, more intriguing questions, more difficult questions, we should appreciate and reward right. questioning. I think if we follow this approach, students will open up and uh, you will find they will not remain with doubts. And right. once they start asking questions in a very comfortable environment, uh, uh, I think uh, curiosity uh, can be encouraged. Uh, I'm again reminded of a famous book by Harlan Cleveland of 1990s, okay. who said uh, the, the title was Empires of Mind, you know where it said that the knowledge and minds will rule the world in the times to come. And there he coined two, two terms. One was called sense of wonder. Sense and of the, uh, and the, the second word was portable ignorance. Uh, of course, portable ignorance. Uh, portable is, ignorance, okay. Portable nice ignorance is something to deal with the teachers and perhaps adult learners. And sense of wonder applies to everybody. In fact, in journalism as a profession, a uh, sense of wonder and portable ignorance are practiced as essential virtues. Portable ignorance says that to be good learners, you need to keep aside what you already know and listen to the uh, speaker or the teacher or to the book you're reading or to the video or the audio you're listening to 
and try to absorb this can only happen when your mind is open and you have kept aside what you already know so sometimes many of us say that oh, what can i learn from so and so i already know much more about the subject and sense of wonder says when you hear something new express the wonder of new knowledge you are acquiring in fact these two virtues if we can inculcate in the child right from the beginning believe me we can make them good learners and instead of teaching a teaching learning process will shift towards learning and learning you know uh, happens when the power to learn the hand of the children or the students you just told yes so if you are able to effectively transfer that by practicing these two virtues uh, i'm sure uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, curiosity as as a something which prevails in the teaching learning process now to do that when i said model uh, instruction design plays a very very important role now instruction design uh, traditionally i'm sure in india has been completely ignored we didn't practice this you will agree with me that in schools at least we have something called uh, lesson planning uh, as a part of the yes, beard yes. or the formal training program in higher education we don't have anything of this sort but even in beard program the kind of uh, lesson plan we are taught is very standard and does not really consider curiosity and self learning as a part of the teaching learning plan and therefore that needs to be uh, modified uh, in in addition to encouraging and uh, rewarding questions i think uh, the instruction design should uh, presume diversity of audience you will agree with me when we have diverse students both in terms of gender the academic background the socio economic background as well as uh, high iq and not so high iq i would say there's nothing like low iq but not so high iq uh, students and then when i say not so high iq uh, also would mean that they may have a different kind of intelligence in them which is stronger than others and right. i'm referring to um, instruction design capturing the multiple intelligence theory i think there was never a more opportune time than this that we bring in the gartner's theory of multiple intelligence recognizing the fact that every student has a different style of learning we must recognize and then design our instructions and the lessons and the lectures according to a variety of uh, uh, intelligences which my audience may possess and once we do that uh, i'll be able to uh, frame the problems the questions and the assignments in such a way where every one's different style is uh, taken care of i can give an example uh, i remember it was 3 4 years ago uh, we gave a project on uh, how to make a 3d printer and two groups chose the same topic i allowed it but i said you will follow different method of doing the project one was completely research based and second one was hands on wherein they will collect material and you will be it will be very interesting to know pranav that uh, the one who chose research method of project they were basically brighter students it was a group of 6 7 students who came from different disciplines and the one okay. who ch- chose hands on was a uh, mediocre so just had pass grades and were not very good at writing or uh, they didn't have so much of refined research skills kind of things and they chose uh, a practical way of doing this project and what happened at the end of the semester you will be surprised to know is that the one which chose research method as the method of doing project came up with a very nicely bound report like a phd thesis and with about 100 references cited at the end very very comprehensive and they had good presentation skill good uh, english they could speak and they made a very good presentation and naturally they were awarded a plus by the professor the other group which consisted of people who didn't have such communication skills they actually made a 3d printer and because they could not present well they were awarded b plus grade and naturally they'll be annoyed they were not satisfied and they they carried out a procession and brought that uh, 3d printer which didn't have a nice casing it was open wires and everything and kept on my table and sir we are unhappy with the, the grades we have been awarded they have only thought about making a 3d printer we have made actually 3d printer and in those days uh, you know 3d printer was costing around uh, 600000 rupees in the market they made it for 42000 rupees from the waste okay. material and they said sir we want to print a chocolate for you tell us which flavor you like and they started the printer and the chocolate started printing in fact 
Now, this points out to another issue in education, uh, which can promote this kind of curiosity and creativity and innovation, which the second group demonstrated. If you can reform our examination assessment process, because today students are more comfortable with theoretical uh, learning because of the score marks in a time bound examination. If right. our assessment can also capture the learning through this kind of hands on project, I think they'll be more uh, motivated to adopt those kind of practice in teaching learning process. So I think uh, I strongly recommend to all uh, those who are involved in school and higher education administration. They should seriously look at bringing variety of assessment tools as you move through the semesters uh, and the years. Uh, the, the other thing which uh, we should do is that create platforms and opportunities for students to lead the discussion in the classroom rather than being one sided. And this can make the uh, better students to make other students learn from them. Uh, many practices I have come across, and I'm sure you must have seen also, there are schools who make ability sections. Right. There, are, there are schools and colleges which will put all the brighter students. Now, bright in one section. A definition of bright could, of course, be debated uh, among the people. What do you call as bright? Now, that one silent message which uh, it gives is that others are not bright. Others are not able. Now, that's a demotivating kind of thing. In fact, I said earlier, we must promote diversity rather than uniqueness in the classroom because right. uh, the, the students will learn from each other. And for that, of course, we have to design the teaching learning uh, process like this. And in such a scenario, students should be encouraged to take the lead in discussion. And we as teachers can be moderators, can be facilitators. Suppose you find they're going astray, they are going away from the topic of discussion because you have to complete the topic also, which is a pressure on every teacher you bring them back, moderate, and you believe me, the learning which will take place in the classroom will be of a very, very uh, high quality. The uh, art of questioning is something which needs to be taught. And right. it starts with creating an environment where students are encouraged to ask questions. It is also called in today's term, uh, de-googling. Now you will agree with me, Google has only answers. It doesn't tell you how to frame questions. Right, very right. And and our children are being pushed towards Googling and they're, they're able to find any answer. So what has happened, they're busy with us finding answers rather than trying to learn how to ask quality questions. And uh, uh, what I'm saying is that by de-Googling, I mean, uh, bring back the Socratic method of teaching learning. You know, Socrates, uh, the philosopher uh, around 400 BC, uh, he did not give answers to questions straight away. He rather asked a question response to a question and then enabled students and children to find answer to this question. If they're able right. to do that, they'll automatically find answer to their own question. So I think we must empower children and encourage them and facilitate them to find answers to their own questions. But before that, they should be able to ask good quality, high quality questions. Right. Now, the questioning can also be uh, inculcated in children by the teachers. I'm reminded of uh, uh, an incident about four or five years ago. I was addressing uh, uh, teachers of about five government schools in Punjab. And uh, this was organized by uh, the local uh, member of parliament who had adopted these uh, schools. And uh, the mandate was that how he can improve the quality. And one day he asked me to, to interact with the teachers. And we were just discussing how to ask quality questions to children. Let us say class three or four, uh, a teacher asks a question, tell me what is the capital of Punjab? Now, naturally, every child is expected to give a correct answer, which is Chandigarh. And as a teacher, you will pick the correct answers and cross the wrong answers. Now, the class did not even learn one thing that is, what is the capital city of Punjab? Instead of this, if question could be rephrased. Instead of asking capital of Punjab, they should ask children, name a state of India and its capital. You'll agree with me out of 30, 35 children in the classroom, at least 20 states will be named. Very good. I'm not saying all 29, 30 states will be named, or at least, at least 15 states will be named and their capitals will be named. And once Excellent. they start, every child will learn 15 times than the previous question. And that's what I mean by 
art of asking questions. Teachers can, teachers can start this in fact. And this twist in the question can enhance the learning uh, 15 times and children will develop curiosity because they will think about different states and their capital. Uh, there are some of the very simple ways of we as teachers uh, could practice. When you teach any topic in the class, uh, it's a great idea if you can start with uh, some of the current happenings, current affairs, even if they are controversial. Of course, you can be slightly cautious. You don't get into the controversy while discussing this. But once you start with a current topic, which is being debated everywhere, though controversial, believe me, everybody becomes very attentive. And then based on that, you drive them towards the topic, for example, public policy, if you're teaching in higher education. Right. Can you start with some of the statements made by our honorable uh, external affairs minister in recent times? Right. How he was talking to that uh, anchor uh, from America, where he uh, almost snubbed her, almost uh, uh, told that her question was not relevant. And when he made a statement that Europe has to come out with the mindset that their problems right. is world's problem, world's problem is not theirs. It's a great statement. And apart from the statement, it tells us so much about that how India is able to speak from a position of power. Right. From this, from this position of power, Pranav, what I'm trying to tell to the students of higher education is that it does not come because of foreign ministers like him. It comes from so many things. For True. example, how India has emphasized on infrastructure development, how it has emphasized on strengthening our armed forces, how it has modernized our armed forces, how uh, top class roads have gone up to the international yes. borders uh, and changing the narrative that a soldier is not someone who stands on the border and guards the border. I think it's much more than that. He yes. is giving us the power to negotiate with our partners in business and trade and economics. And it has different impact for diplomacy, the subject, for example. Now, diplomacy is not there to only support the soldier. It is ahead of the soldier and behind the soldier. I think right. this is how uh, the topic of public policy could be built from a recent statement made by external affairs minister. And that's what I meant by uh, start the discussion with a current topic, uh, how public policy is uh, being shaped and how it is not a standalone topic, it is linked to economics, infrastructure, uh, defense, modernization. Yes. And, and then you can, in the same breath, you can link it to Atmir Bharat, how this one single mission has driven India towards uh, self-reliance. I think it is right. the self-reliance which is making us to look people uh, eye to eye and makes us kind of bold statements. It is not simply happening. So uh, this is my uh, example of how we can start with the uh, current topics. And believe me, uh, the, the students will uh, uh, start asking uh, more and more questions. Uh, many of us as teachers think that uh, if I'm able to answer all the questions, I'm a good teacher. I'm afraid I'm not. In fact, uh, it is not necessary to answer all the questions. Because right. my belief is that once you answer the question, the learning stops there. I think uh, I should encourage uh, students to find different alternatives. Uh, let me give an example. When you discuss a case study uh, from the past, uh, there are various solutions, various, various approaches the management or the person involved could take. But there was only one thing which was done and the company either succeeded or did not succeed. And this is how we learn from the real life case studies. I think the purpose of case study as a teacher I should take is that how we can make students to develop different pathways, different solutions, that what you could have done, what right. you could have done. And this way, uh, believe me, uh, many times I have found as a teacher, I go to the class with one solution to the case study, but when I come back, I come with three, four more solutions which are better than my solutions. So I think uh, these are the methods where students and teachers both learn together. It requires humility on the part of the teacher. It requires uh, openness and it requires right. uh, an acceptance that I may not know all the answers. I think this kind of approach creates a very free and frank atmosphere in the class, having respect for each other. 
I should not be giving wrong answers. I may not know many answers, but there's a way of saying that, let me check and come back to you. But do not ever suppress uh, the questions being asked by the students or children, right. respective of whether they're in school or uh, uh, colleges. The other thing I can say, uh, uh, you know, in recent uh, uh, 10, 20 years, I'm sure you have noticed this phenomena. The number of hours we engage with the children in the classroom is going up. In uh, many of the colleges, particularly, uh, number of contact hours have increased as much as 35 to 40 hours a week. Okay. Now, to my mind, it is criminally high. Right. Children cannot have an attention span so okay. long, which is about, let's say, uh, seven to eight hours a day, depending on whether you work five days a week or six days a week. I think the learning needs to be shifted outside the classroom. We right. must design uh, certain outbound activities, field-based projects and assignments where uh, they're not restricted within the boundaries of the classroom. Right. And these projects should be defined by students on their own rather than you prescribing something. It may require a discussion debate for about maybe seven to 10 days in the beginning of the semester, but so be it, permit them. And you as a teacher keep on throwing ideas, but don't give concluding ideas. Let students come up with a topic. And once it happens, they start owning the idea. They can right. research related to the idea. They can start writing an essay on that. They can start writing a blog on that or an article or a position paper or a uh, whatever kind of uh, writing they want to involve themselves into. Uh, they'll write and own it. And if possible, make it a group assignment rather than an individual assignment. Once group assignment uh, takes place, they start learning from each other and they start developing respect for others' perspectives. Right. And they also develop different perspectives. I have seen this to be a very, very effective method of, of developing curiosity. I can give an example from class two if the, the children from or the teachers from or schools are listening to it. I remember I was sitting through a class two in a school, uh, in a family school of mine. And the teacher, uh, in a session of 35, 40 minutes, she took only five to seven minutes and told the children that we will today uh, learn noun and proper noun. It's a topic in English subject. And she gave a couple of examples of what a noun means and what a proper noun means. So, for example, pranav guha is a noun, but uh, it's a proper noun. But you know, uh, anchor of education TV could be a noun, but Pranav Guha anchor could be a proper noun. Right. Like this, take it through three examples. And you know, uh, I remember after five minutes, he said, children go out of the class, come back in 15 minutes. And he should bring at least five examples of noun and proper noun. So uh, children went around, class two children, about 20 children of them. Uh, they wrote car and which car it was bus, which bus it was, principal, so-and-so, mm -hmm. the name of the principal. You know, in 15 minutes, now they came with examples, highest was 25 and minimum was 15. Wow. I'm talking of class two children. Wow. Now, I don't think there could be a better, better way of teaching noun and proper noun to those small kids uh, than this. And more importantly, they will never forget the definition. They'll remember for life. Never. That's the beauty of this kind of teaching learning method. So I think uh, what I want to say uh, to the, the audience today is there's no other way of bringing curiosity in the children than a very, very uh, innovative and engaging instruction design. You know, engagement per se does not mean curiosity. Engagement could be without curiosity also, but it's one of the ways of doing it. If we can make students with different backgrounds, uh, weaker students with uh, more uh, uh, better students learning from each other, I think uh, is the best way to uh, promote curiosity as far as teaching learning is concerned. Uh, I can give many examples of recently in our own Jain University, we started uh, a new concept. This was prompted by implementation of national education policy. Uh, you would know that for the last two years, we've been struggling to uh, find ways and means of uh, uh, how to implement NEP. Everybody knows what to implement. 
policy documents say it, all seminars, conferences, we've been saying it. But I think very uh, few of us have been able to find the tools of implementation on the ground. Uh, for example, you want to promote entrepreneurship, which uh, is emphasized in uh, NAP 2020. But the question is how to do it? There has to be something in the curriculum, in the teaching learning process, which promotes entrepreneurship. Uh, it could be a project-based learning, project-centric learning, field work, or maybe entrepreneurship as a structured module. There are various ways of doing it. But then there are 20, 25 such recommendations which you need to implement, and there can be 25 different instruments. So what we did uh, in our case, so we have developed something called project-centric learning, uh, transdisciplinary project-centric learning is its complete name. It's a cooperated concept. What it does, uh, first, it is different from project-based learning. Project-based learning, the project relates to a particular subject. Whereas in project-centric learning, the project becomes central to all the subjects being taught in a year or a semester, or even previously. They support it. And hence, it is called transdisciplinary. The project is a group project, and the group members come from different programs, not from one program. Let's say somebody from management, somebody from design, somebody from engineering, law, and so on. A diversity of the group members is emphasized in this so that you can develop different perspectives, you can think from their perspective. And it's a real life topic which they have to choose. We permit brainstorming sessions and give them a lot of reading and writing, including novels and fictions and uh, uh, papers, books, and classics related to subject or remotely related to subjects. And thus we develop reading habits and we also promote them to continuously keep writing. For example, in Britain, we'll say, suppose you have to write a report on so-and-so book, you have to write a book review on so-and-so book. So the writing is continuously there. They can start writing blogs or a social media post. And in the process, what you teach them, which people don't even learn in PhD program, you'll be surprised to know, I've come across PhD cases where they don't know the difference between bibliography and references. We teach our students through this kind of method. We teach them how to cite references in APA format, for example. People don't learn throughout their life. We want to bring research early enough in the education process, which is again emphasized on the national education policy. So this concept has helped us implement one, inter and transdisciplinarity, which is the mainstay of NEP 2020, total flexibility in choosing the topic of the project, what you want to work on. Social outreach, because many of the ideas will be on social issues and problems. Alignment of education to regional, national, and global needs and missions and priorities. For example, if we can link any topic to SDGs of United Nations or missions like Atmanir Bharat Mission, Make in India, Skill India kind of missions, we are able to align education towards these missions and priorities. Uh, it's bringing research, it's bringing uh, project-based learning is a part of this. And believe me, it, it also promotes uh, uh, group uh, dynamics, leadership, team member, uh, and developing social sensitivities and sensibilities in the students, which is much beyond our professional competence we've been trying to uh, bring in. And most importantly, it helps university to meet its outcomes. For example, today, whether ranking or rating or accreditation, uh, these three things are definitely looked at. Publications, patents, and how much you've been contributing towards entrepreneurship. At the end of the program, every student has to publish either a paper or a patent. And so the patent ideas can be commercialized in the form of startups. May it be a solopreneurship. We want our students to be entrepreneurial. They may not own enterprises, but they'll turn to be uh, good employees when they start working with an organization. And uh, if last one year's results are any indication, it has been an absolutely fascinating experience. I'll just give an example. Only in one undergraduate management program, in one semester, 279 projects which are converted into publishable papers and 271 papers ready to publish. And the number of patents in the university has gone up from 15 to 250 in one year. Uh, thanks to the contribution of faculty as well as students are coming into it. So we developed this concept wherein overall ecosystem of innovation creativity was created. And we believe this will uh, lead to in a couple of years time, 
every student at least thinking of uh, uh, any issue in a very entrepreneurial way. And we believe that uh, we'll be able to create entrepreneurs more than the global percentage, which is about eight to 9% success rate. We should be able to reach 20, 25, 30%. So we believe that in the next two to three years. It all depends on the instruction design a particular institution follows. So I think I'll stop here. If any questions or queries, uh, uh, I can take further. You to unmute yourself. Yeah. I think all the, um, it was very interesting. I think all the stakeholders, all principals, all vice chancellors, students, teachers, professors will like it. And I really like that the way you told for the class uh, two in Punjab, that tell ask them any state and their capital. Yes. Because of the peer learning, I think they will learn at least 20 more states in one go. Then your proper noun and now yes. it was also a wonderful thing. And sir, and you told me a very interesting thing. Sir, in our school, whenever our class teacher or any subject teachers take us out in the, uh, like there were a lot of trees out there, yes. outside the class, so whatever I was taught under the trees, I still remember them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same happens in business also. Whenever I go out to some coffee shop and do my work, my concentration is more than uh, office. Because in office, I'm busy in admin work, so many Absolutely. things, so many things are going there. I think there's a lot of learning from your thing, Mr. Chancellor. I'm really thankful to you and keep on disturbing you. Uh, Pranav, I can give a couple of other examples. I'm sure the teachers and children will benefit. Yes, please, please. I, sir. I remember uh, the school children were being taught about road signs and road safety. Road, road. Road. Okay. Uh, or the traffic rules, for example. Got, 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 got it. Now, there's one way of uh, teaching them through a lecture. Right. You can make some signs on the board or at the most project on the projector and discuss it. Uh, we don't do it. We put all the children in a bus and take them on a road. Correct. On national highway, go for four or five kilometers and come back. And in the process, you would have told them which sign means what. Right. When you teach them means of communication and history of communication, for example, uh, again, we, we don't teach them that started with post office, post and telegraph, what was telegram, what was telegraph, you know, and how it came to the current uh, uh, version of courier and mail and everything. You have to trace the history. Uh, we took the children to post office. And the postman showed them the kind of letters we used to use. Believe me, it so got so imprinted on their minds, they will never forget in their lives. Right. I think move them out of the classroom is the message I want to give, rather than uh, simulating everything in the classroom and one way kind of uh, flow it should not have. When they go to the field, it ensures one, they're able to see it also in real life. Two, there were different settings. Three, they will interact with the people outside the school. And four, I think uh, they become more curious. Anything when you learn by doing it is more permanent. It will remain yes. with you forever. And they're able to think of different alternatives. Uh, you're developing in them, not the knowledge, but ability to acquire knowledge as you go along, a capability to learn continuously. I think that is what is required uh, 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 in, in education. I have to cite one of the greatest weakness is this, that we don't develop capital to learn. And the uh, final message I can give, uh, many people may not like it. Uh, I'll request all the parents, teachers, and students to get out of the coaching mentality. Yes, even I, I, I agree, I agree, I'm with you, sir. Is, uh, this coaching mentality for me is a chapter, it's not a sentence. One, it takes away children from all the cultural activities, debates, social gatherings, uh, any sports activities from class six onwards. I have request with folded hands to every elder, don't deny the children the childhood. Right. And it can only happen when we uh, get out of this curse of coaching uh, as far as our children are concerned, because that has more examination orientation and not learning mm -hmm. orientation. And that is one of the reasons why the curiosity of our children is being killed. I think we need to come out of this. And uh, uh, it's happening in every walk of life. Uh, you, you don't uh, allow your children to enjoy life, of course, but also Thanks, don't, don't uh, emphasize in character building. Thank you. I 100% agree with you, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. 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 Vice Chancellor on this. And uh, I think you told me this thing 10 years back also. I follow that it very religiously yeah. only. 
I see only one or two students, they get into IIT or other places. The rest of them are sir, not at all doing well. Anyway, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for your thank time. You. Thank you so much. I'm sure and I will uh, I'll request all the audience, they can put their questions on the YouTube. So then next session when we have with uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Dr. Raj Singh, we can have the answers from him. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.